the product that Firebase is probably most well known for is the real-time database. Um, it's a schemaless JSON sort of document storage type database that is able to push updates out to clients in real time. Um, it makes it an excellent tool for any real time applications you may have, like chat apps or social media or any type of application where you want to be able to push stuff out to your clients with minimal code and, uh, and, and have it be fast. So Firebase, over the last couple years, has added a lot of products uh, being backed by Google Cloud Platform infrastructure. Uh, Firebase hosting, Firebase functions, Firebase storage. They have auth that makes it really easy to integrate authentication into your mobile or web apps. Uh, the SDKs for mobile, iOS and Android, can give you access to things like analytics and uh, test labs and A-B testing. And on the web, the J JavaScript SDK gives you the same access to all the Firebase uh, real-time database APIs and things like that. Um, Firebase has Angular extensions for its APIs. And uh, for Angular, this is Angular Fire, uh, like I said, maintained by James. Um, Angular Fire allows you to very easily integrate uh, Firebase's real-time functionality, including authentication into your Angular applications. Um, with just a couple lines of code, you could have changes in your database being synced all the way to the DOM in your browser um, automatically without having to build any sort of, uh, of that real-time infrastructure yourself. Uh, this is the homepage for Firebase. It's got all kinds of fun stuff for you to read. Um, Firebase has been around for a while. How many of you have actually used Firebase before? So almost everybody. I will be skipping some things in this workshop, stuff that maybe I haven't skipped in the past, but uh, that we have some, some newer serverless technologies from Google Cloud that we want to demo um, in combination with an Angular universal application. And so some of the Firebase stuff is actually already deployed, and we'll just be using it. Um, so we'll be focus focusing on the, 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 the Angular universal app itself with its uh, server-side rendering capabilities uh, deployed on a serverless environment in Google Cloud. So a brand new product uh, that Google Cloud just announced um, a week or two ago is called Google Cloud Run. Um, Google Cloud Run is a hosted version of Knative. Knative is an open source specification and product for running uh, stateless uh, container-based workloads. Um, so Kubernetes is uh, the open source container orchestration platform. Knative is uh, made to run on Kubernetes and to run your stateless workloads. So basically, you have a Docker image, it's stateless, you want to be able to just deploy them, scale them on Kubernetes, send HTTP, HTTP requests to them, um, things like that. So uh, Cloud Run is our hosted version. It allows you to simply spin up a, for example, Angular Universal application that basically is packaged up as a Docker image and can receive an HTTP request. For example, when you visit the uh, container in your browser, um, which means that your application can serve a web application and then with uh, just, a, just like two lines of uh, deployment commands, we can have a stateless, uh, serverless, Angular universal app. And we didn't have to worry about VMs. We didn't have to worry about security updates or, or anything like that. We just wrote some node code, and we ran a command to deploy it, and it can scale automatically for us. OK, so we have a repository that we prepared that has uh, the source code for all this. It's at uh, James Daniels um, on Snapshot is the name of the repository. So you guys are all welcome to go pull that up if any of you want to be following along. <clears throat> I have prepared five branches, I think, on the repo. Each represents sort of one step in our workshop. Um, the first step in the workshop would be step zero. Uh, so workshop dash, uh, dash zero. And uh, if you were to clone the repo and check out uh, workshop dash zero, that would get your repository in the sort of initial state that we need to start the workshop. So if you're wanting to be doing all this on your, your local workstation or Mac or whatever you have, uh, there are a couple things that you'd want to have installed. Um, I, added, I created a wiki page just over here. If you go to the wiki, click workshop. Um, 
things you would need to have locally, you would need to have Node.js installed, uh, you would need to have the Firebase tools installed, the Google Cloud SDK, all three of those, those things are things you can Google, and I'm sure the first result will take you to how to install it. Uh, you also need a Google account. <coughs> I'm going to use an alternative uh, to, from my work local machine. Instead of using that, I'm going to use Google Cloud Shell, which means in the Google Cloud Console for my cloud project, I can open a shell right there, and it actually has all that stuff installed already, so I don't need to do it. Um, and if any of you were to open the Google Cloud Console and click Open Shell yourself, you also would have a, a free shell opened up for you, which would have all that same stuff installed, ready to go. And so you, don't, you wouldn't have to worry about preparing your local workstation if you want to use Cloud Shell. OK, so to just sort of break the ice on Google Cloud Run, uh, we're going to try the Google Cloud Run Quick Start, which is really, it's really short. So it's uh, under Getting Started, Step 5. There's a link here. Do the Cloud Run Quick Start. Is that pretty visible there? OK, so before you get, begin, you need a project. Um, you would need to enable billing, which I have already done on a pre-prepared pre project. Uh, step 1, to deploy a container, go to Cloud Run. So what's opening here is the Google Cloud Console. And it has opened the Cloud Run uh, dashboard for me. As we can see, I don't have any services deployed so far. So to deploy a service, it says, creates, click Create Service. OK, Create Service. And what does it want me to do? OK, enter a path to a Docker image. Looks like there's already a prepackaged container we can use, or image we can use called Cloud Run Hello. Um, it's going to default our service name to just Hello. Select a region. There's only one region where it's available so far, so that's easy. And allow unauthenticated requests. This will allow us to hit our container from you know, the external internet, basically. Um, and I don't think we need to worry about any additional settings. OK, so I'm going to click uh, Create. Something happened, I'm sure. Yep, there we go. OK, so it's deploying the container for us. How many of you have used App Engine before? Google App Engine. Uh, what about the standard environment for App Engine? A couple of hands. What about the flexible environment? So those of you who have used the flexible environment, do you remember how long it takes to deploy App Engine Flexible? Which order of magnitude of minutes <laughs> do you want to pick? Um, so with Google Cloud Run, the very first time you deploy a service, it takes a little longer. But subsequent deploys of the same service uh, uh, will happen on the order of 30 seconds. So this is done. And it has migrated traffic to my new deployment. And right here, it has the URL of my deployment. So if I just click that, it opens up, and it's running. So what this is, is a Docker image that's been deployed to Google Cloud and is deployed at this URL. And every time an incoming request happens, uh, this container receives that request. Um, this differs from Google Cloud Functions and Firebase Functions if, you, if you've used those before in that Google Cloud Run supports concurrency, which means a single instance um, a single container instance can handle multiple concurrent requests at a time, whereas with Cloud Functions, every single uh, container instance can only handle one at a time. So in order to handle more than one with Cloud or Firebase Functions, uh, the service would have to spin up multiple instances, and so it is maybe more expensive that way. With Cloud Run, a single container instance can handle uh, many concurrent connections, and that is configurable at deploy time. You can choose how many concurrent connections should be allowed to uh, go to a single instance of yours. And that allows you to sort of fine tune the scalability of your Cloud Run instances. Um, depending on how much memory your instance would require to handle a single request, you can sort of figure that out and then do some math and figure out how many concurrent requests I should allow, allow per instance before Cloud Run will make a new instance for me. Um, there was something else I was going to say about Cloud Run and concurrency. We'll have to come back to that. 
OK, so this is done. We figured it out. Cloud Run It's pretty cool. So this was just some prepackaged Hello World container. We're going to swap it out in this workshop for an Angular Universal app. And we'll see how Angular, Angular Universal interacts with Cloud Run and some of the other uh, uh, services that Google Cloud offers. So if we go back to our wiki, let's see what it says to do next. Running our app. OK, so to do this, I'm going to go back over to my Google Cloud Console, and I'm going to click this Activate Cloud Shell button. It's in the top right corner. This will allow me to bypass the need to install anything locally or worry about my local machine. I, uh, I still have the 2015 MacBook Pro. I'm going to hold on to it as long as I can. But my trackpad is starting to die, <laughs> so I don't have the mechanical click anymore. So I have no way to resize anything. <laughs> So you're stuck with how big my shell is down there. Um, no, nor can I reorder my Chrome tabs unless anyone knows of some sort of hotkey that can do that. Um, but anyway, so here I have a Cloud Shell, and it is already configured to use um, my ng-comp 2019 workshop project. And if you were to have your own project created, then obviously it would be pre-configured to your project. So back to the workshop. Step one, looks like I am going to pull. So uh, uh, step one is create a Google Cloud Source repository. Um, it's just a free service uh, that lets you create repos get repositories within your cloud projects and store your source code. It can also mirror uh, source code that is uh, located in a GitHub or Bitbucket. Why would I do this? Um, we will use this uh, Google Cloud Source repository to take advantage of some of the automatic continuous build uh, features that we have um, in order to uh, automatically deploy our Cloud Run service as we change our code. So I'm going to create this repo. It's enabling the source repository API, and now it's, and then it's going to create the repo. Sometimes it takes a minute to enable an API. Oh, I skipped a step. It wanted me to go do a before EBN, which was enable the API. You can actually, in the Cloud Console, you can see all the APIs that are enabled for your project. If you click the hamburger menu and click on APIs and services, you can also search for any part of uh, the Cloud Console that you may be interested in in the search bar at the top. And Google Cloud Source Repositories API appears to be enabled. So I'm going to just try this command again. There we go. OK, so I just created a Google Cloud Source repository. And now I'm going to clone that repository into my Cloud Shell. It's an empty repository. It doesn't have anything in it yet. Whoops. I forgot to remove my test that I was already doing. OK, so now I'm cl cloning it. It's an empty repository, like I said. And once I'm in the repository, I'm going to pull over James's on snapshot repo. And I'm going to check out workshop. Let's see, let's, let's check out master first. So what I did is I set uh, James's repository as the upstream. That's the name of that remote. That's the name I gave it. And then I pulled it into the repo. I'm on the master branch now, so we can see there's a bunch of stuff in there. And I'm going to take that, and I'm going to push it to origin, origin being the Google Cloud Source 
remote. So we can actually go look at, uh, let's see, source, repositories, first result, and we can see that we have a repository called on snapshot, and it has all the stuff in it that the repo had on GitHub. There's James. <clears throat> okay, so to start the workshop, I'm going to switch over to branch workshop-0. Okay, now my code is ready to start the workshop. Okay, we did all that. Okay, step one, install dependencies. Like I said, Node is already installed in the Cloud Shell. I can just run npm install and it'll start doing its thing. Uh, so while this is installing, you can actually open some, some features of Cloud Shell. You can op op open multiple sessions at a time and it uses uh, Tmux, so even if it, you lose internet connection temporarily or it closes or whatever, you'll be able to open it again and then come back right to the same state. Um, the Cloud Shell itself is backed by a virtual machine, a Google Cloud Compute Engine instance that is just for you. It's tied to you as a user. Um, and it has like a home directory that's got like a gigabyte of space or something, and it will just follow you around from project to project. Um, and you can just use it as sort of like a workspace as you, you do stuff with your projects. Um, some other features of Cloud Shell are you can actually open a editor in the browser that will allow you to work on the code that you actually are, have in your shell. And it also has a web preview uh, feature, which we are going to use here in just a second. So I just finished all, installing all the dependencies. Now I'm going to build everything. And this is running a couple commands. We can actually go examine the package JSON file to see what they're doing. Let's see, is that visible? So let's see. We got some scripts in our package.json. Um, this repository, correct me if I'm wrong, James, was based on the Angular Universal Starter repo. Yeah. So we've got a couple build commands in here. Uh, build prod uh, builds, I believe, the client and uses ahead of time uh, compilation, and it builds it for prod mode. Build SSR builds the server file, which is just a server.ts, um, and that's about, about what we're doing. So some advantages and disadvantages of Cloud Shell. One of the advantages is it has really fast network connection. <laughs> um, so it's got like, I don't know, like probably like gigabit available or something. And so when you're doing any sort of network I.O. in Cloud Shell, it'll be really fast. So if you're at, say, a conference and you're trying to NPM install locally, that could take a long time or just die. Uh, but if you have Cloud Shell, then you have access to, you know, it's got its own network and is really fast. Now, one of the downsides of Cloud Shell, uh, I think the VM that you are given for this is just like a one virtual CPU. Uh, from Compute Engine, um, whereas if you're running npm install locally, you might have like quad-core i7 or something available to you, right? So trade-offs there, um, which means npm install was fast, but the Angular build might be slow on Cloud Shell. Uh, so it would probably be done by now if I was doing this on my Mac directly. We can actually probably test it. Make it bigger. We, can, we should have done them at the same time so we could see which one would f finish first. So right now, this NPM install is happening on conference Wi-Fi. But I actually already ran it, so it'll probably be really fast. Okay. I did already run it, so it cheated. Okay, so Cloud Shell is still running the build. We're at 92%. And locally, We'll see if we can catch up. Uh, so the way the web preview works is, by default, it will simply expect, um, it'll expect your process or whatever web app you're running in the Cloud Shell to listen on a certain port. And the default is port 8080. Um, so basically, when you open the web preview, it tries to just connect to whatever's on port 8080 and then show you what it responds with. 
Um, by default, our app doesn't do port 8080, or yeah, our app does port uh, 420 by default. So I'm looking for the settings to change the port. I think I'm just skipping right over it. Where is it? Oh, change port. OK, so I think our app runs on 4200. So instead of doing 8080, we'll do 4200. Ah, I, I have deployed it before. And right now, it's using a service worker. So the app is still there. So we're going to just dis how do we turn it off? There we go. I turned off the service worker. And right now, it says there's nothing listening on port 4200, so I can't preview an app for you. And it's still building. <laughs> it's almost done. Once it's done, we'll start it. Locally, it finished, obviously. We've got more CPU power available. Um, so if I run it locally, I think, uh, what was the command? Whoops. It was npm run serve SSR. So I've got it running locally. I could just test it there if I want, localhost 4200. Here's the app. Uh, I'm not sure what this data is. It looks like blog posts from Firebase or something. Yeah, so a bunch of Fire, uh, Firebase blog posts. Um, the home page displays a list of articles. You click on one, it takes you to the article, displays a bunch of comments. You can also click on an author, and it will show you the author's face and the articles that they've written. So if we actually go back and examine this page, so I've turned the service worker off so we can demonstrate the server-side rendering. If you had the service worker on, then it would actually bypass the server-side rendering, and the service worker would be able to almost instantaneously give the browser an initial response, um, and after which the client-side JavaScript would take over, and the preboot would would start up, and the Angular app would take over the DOM from that point forward. I turn off the service worker so we can force it to make a new get request to the server so it can get the response from the server, which will be some server-side rendered stuff. So I turned off the service worker, and I'm going to refresh the page. And I'm going to go take a look at this initial response we got back. Again, I apologize. I cannot resize this window. <laughs> Maybe I can move it. I don't know if that's much better. OK, so we got some HTML back. Now, how do we know if this actually did any server-side rendering or not? If we actually go look at the index.html file, which is right here, so far, the default index.html file has all the same stuff that I'm seeing in this response. So how do we know if it did any server-side rendering or not? If we look at the index.html file, down at the bottom, it's got an app root with a router outlet. So presumably, on the client side, once it matches a route, the router is going to take some assigned component and render it into the router outlet location, which means if it's server-side rendered correctly, I will not see this in the response in the browser. I, actually, I will see something rendered already. So if we go back over here, we can scroll all the way down past this embedded JavaScript. There's the app root. Looks like the router outlet was the very first thing inside the app root. And it's not formatted very nicely, so I'm going to have to scroll to the right. But so far, I'm seeing a router outlet and a bunch of HTML. Keep scrolling. Lots and lots of HTML. A lot of HTML. So it did server-side render. All the HTML is there. Yay. Um, Angular Universal. So what happens is, the server rendered this list of articles in their titles, sent that HTML to the browser. It was rendered. The browser was able to very quickly get that HTML response without having to wait for the JavaScript to all load into the browser before it can actually render anything. Once the JavaScript arrives, though, it then takes over, and my interactivity kicks in, and I'm able to click on things and move around. So if I were to click on one of these articles, that is not going to be server-side rendered. That was all handled client-side by the Angular um, swapping out the view for the new component with, for the new route. However, if I do a refresh with my service worker disabled, then I can go back and, and examine that initial response. 
scroll back down, and I can see that this also indeed was server-side rendered. And you can see there's a ton of content here. The entire content of the article was server-side rendered. But if I say, let's say I go back, and then I go forward to the article, there was no additional server-side render call. Everything just happened client-side. Um, so why would people do server-side rendering? One, it makes your app more accessible by web crawlers. So for search engine opti optimization purposes, um, having all the content readily available to a web crawler um, can aid you in your SEO goals. Uh, the second thing would be performance. If your page needs to do a lot of um, I.O., perhaps, or if you have a very large application with a lot of, a lot of JavaScript, um, and it takes a long time for that to be transferred to the browser over the wire, on slow connections, let's say cheaper mobile devices or in parts of the world where people have slower connections, then you don't want to make them wait all the time it takes for that JavaScript to make it to their browser. Instead, your a very initial response back to them can be the actual HTML of the page already rendered, and it produces a better user experience um, for people in that situation. And then once the JavaScript does arrive on their device, uh, it can then take over the rest of the application, and they can have that uh, interactive client-side experience. So I spent a lot of time talking. And yes, Cloud Shell finished building. Um, so we demoed the app locally. I just want to show it off uh, in the Cloud Shell as well. So npm run serve SSR. It's the same thing I ran locally. And I can now go to my preview. And theoretically, it will work if I refresh. Oh, now it's listening. There we go. So if you ignore all the stuff I did locally, here in Cloud Shell, I've demonstrated uh, creating a repo, uh, cloning it, npm install, uh, building the app and actually running it all in Cloud Shell without having to worry about like, what kind of uh, uh, setup I already had on my local workstation. It makes uh, working on like a, like a Pixelbook or some sort of Chromebook a little more viable, having something like Cloud Shell available to you. Also, if you're in a situation with uh, low network uh, speeds. OK, so we have our Angular Universal application. It's working locally. We have demonstrated that the server-side rendering itself actually works. Um, let's see what's next up on a workshop. Deploying. OK, so we want to deploy our app. So to deploy to Cloud Run, we need to take our app and we need to bundle it up into an image, something that Cloud Run can, can use, can work with. So to bundle it up into an image, we need to create a Docker file. Docker file is a, a standard sort of uh, declarative uh, it, it, de it describes how the image should be bundled up, basically uh, what kind of source code is needed, what commands would need to be run to put the image together, and that's what the Docker file is for. So I'm going to go ahead and create these. Now, do I want to do Cloud Shell or do I want to do local? On Cloud Shell, one option would be to open the editor and go make the files and do stuff like that. Another option would be to check out step one, which we're, so I don't have to do all that stuff. So get checkout <laughs> workshop one. And in workshop one, we can see that now we do have the two files that the wiki was calling for, a gcloud ignore file and a docker file. Uh, the gcloud ignore file makes it so that uh, when the Google Cloud SDK does our deployment, it can ignore certain files. It'll make the deployment a lot faster if we, for example, ignore the node modules file. In addition, when you're packaging up Docker, when you're packaging up images, for performance optimization, you want your image to be as small and as lean as possible. This means fewer bytes to be transferred over the wire from your local workstation to the Google Cloud container registry to the Cloud Run service. Um, so faster deployments. Also, when you have smaller images, it means the cold start time of your Cloud Run instances will be uh, shorter uh, because there's a smaller image to get booted up. Um, and also, uh, that's pretty much the main reason. Faster deploys. <laughs> um, 
And then the doc file, we can just examine this real quick. Uh, we use the official Node.js uh, version 10 image as our base. Uh, we set up a working directory. We copy over package.json and the lock file. Uh, the, during this uh, packaging of the image, it will install dependencies into the image. So every run command that you make adds like a new layer to your image. And so we will have a specific layer that is just the NPM dependencies. And then we copy over our source code. And then we build a new layer in our image, which is going to be uh, the result of running uh, the build command with NPM, so building our application. And I should probably be explaining this while it's running so we don't have to wait for it. So I'm going to go start it real quick, and we'll come back. So what does it want me to do to actually deploy this thing? It wants me to run this command first. In Cloud Shell, the I must have copied the new line because it tried to run the command. <laughs> OK, no new lines. In Cloud Shell, it already has the Cloud SDK installed. So I just need to replace this with my project ID, ng conf 2019 workshop. And what this is doing is it's uh, running a command for the cloud build service of uh, Google Cloud Platform, which you have two ways of building the image. You can build the image locally using a Docker installation that you already have, um, or you can build the image using Cloud Build. What that does is it quickly bundles up your directory, sends it to Cloud Build, and then Cloud Build does the compute work of actually building the image up. And so you can sort of offload that work to another service. So I'm going to just start this build. And what it's going to do is going to package up the directory, and it's going to start sending the build to uh, Cloud Build. Notice here it just printed out some logs are available. So I can actually view the logs right here in my terminal, or I can, I can uh, flip over to, I can just do it here. We can go look at cloud build, cloud build. And we can see that it actually has the build running right there. And we can see the same logs that are, uh, that are in my terminal. I can see them right here in cloud build. So the step it's running right now is npm install. So it's installing the dependencies. Back to the Docker file itself, once it has installed the dependencies and built the application, meaning the Angular client and the server side part of the application, the final step is to tell the Docker image how it's supposed to get started. What is the entry point command? And in, in our case, it's the npm run serve SSR. It's that same command right, we demonstrated uh, locally and, and in Cloud Shell. So what happens is when Cloud Run um, receives a deployment command, it'll take this image once it's been bundled up, and it'll deploy an instance of that uh, image. It'll, it'll spin up a container. And when that container spins up, the first thing it's going to do is run npm run serve SSR. And then it will wait. Uh, for incoming HTTP requests, uh, which I mentioned before, it can handle those concurrently up to whatever your configured limit is before it spins up a second instance or a third or a fourth or a fifth in, 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 or, and scales up to meet your, your traffic. When, you're not, when your instance is not receiving any requests, it will scale to zero. Uh, so that is in contrast to Google Cloud Functions, which cannot scale to zero. and um, Google App Engine flexible environment, which also cannot scale to zero. So if you're thinking about uh, cost, say, uh, with Google Cloud Run, you can scale to zero. If it's not being used, you're not paying for it. Um, in addition, uh, Google Cloud Run has a generous free tier. So if you look at the docs for Cloud Run pricing, you got 2 million free requests. Um, also, all networking cost is free during beta. After beta exit, some, there will be some additional free tier to network egress. Uh, and then beyond that free tier, there will be some cost. So everyone should feel free to go ahead and try Cloud Run for side projects or whatever you're using it for. Firebase uh, dynamic hosting, um, if you're wanting to put an API backend into a Cloud Run instance, you can do that just with an Express app. Um, or you could. You could do other things with Cloud Run, like use it as a serverless environment for some sort of uh, data pipeline um, that's maybe not necessarily embedded in some user-facing request. 
Uh, it's also very handy if you want to use it as like a re recipient of a webhook, like if you're building a GitHub bot or a Slack chat bot or something like that. Um, you can do those with Cloud Functions, though with Cloud Functions, you're kind of limited to the available runtime types. With, with Cloud Run, you can make your own Docker image. So you could write it in Erlang or something and handle your GitHub webhooks. So Cloud Shell, the build, which point is it at now? OK, so it has installed dependencies, and it is currently working on the second half of the Angular build. Uh, it built the front end, and it's now building the server. Realizing we're going to want to run this command as few times as possible during the workshop. <clears throat> and it's finishing up. So it finished the image, and it's now pushing the image to the Google Cloud Container repository. Uh, the Google Cloud Container repository is similar to Docker Hub. It's a place to store images. Um, and it's basically backed by Google Cloud Storage. So they're just blobs sitting in Google Cloud Storage. And Container Registry provides a convenient API on top of that. So Docker can actually talk to the Google Cloud Container Registry, as well as these other Google Cloud services. OK, it finished. So basically, what we just did here is we packaged up our Angular Universal app into a Docker image. And we pushed that up to the Google Cloud Container Registry. The second command is to take that newly deployed image and deploy it to Cloud Run. So we can do that with the UI, but I'm going to go ahead and just run the uh, command line uh, command for that. So ng-conf 2019 workshop. Uh, let's see, pick a region. There's only one choice. Universal is our service name. Sounds good to me. Allow unauthenticated access. We want to say yes. Um, that way, potentially any of you could uh, make a request to my container instance. Otherwise, I, what's the, what would the default be? Like uh, internal network only? Like maybe only a, v other VMs deployed in your project would be able to talk to your Cloud Run instance? Or possibly people? People signed in with Google who have some sort of permissions on the project itself. So it's doing a couple things in parallel. It set up the policy that will enable anyone to hit this instance. It's creating, it's deploying the service and creating a revision. Once it uh, creates the revision, it will route traffic to it. That's the default. Um, so my new instance will start receiving all traffic. So that's done which was blessedly fast compared to App Engine Flexible. Uh, so let's go check it out. OK, so we're looking at the Cloud Build UI here. We can go back to Cloud Run, just see what happened over there. So Cloud Run, here's our universal service. It's got a single revision. It was just deployed, and here's the URL for it. So if I click that, I now see that same Angular universal app that we deployed locally or in, and in Cloud Shell, is now deployed to Cloud Run. So if we were to send 1,000 concurrent requests to this, I'm not sure what the default limit. I think it's like maybe 80 or something. Once it receives more than 80 concurrent requests, Cloud Run spins up more instances. And it does that very fast. So we could send 1,000 concurrent requests, and Cloud Run would instantly scale up to handle all of them at once and be able to serve them. So uh, the very first talk, I would like uh, let's see. Let's just double check that it's still server side rendering real quick. Let's close my preview, close my other local one, close that one. So if I refresh this, let's just double check that uh, service workers are still off. OK, still off on the service workers. Go back to the network tab, click on that initial response. Scroll to the bottom, look over. There it is. All the server-side rendered HTML is there. OK. And then if I go to the home page and click on the blog post again, there were no initial requests for HTML. It just went and rendered all client-side, making a couple RPCs, supposedly, with the, for, to the Firebase uh, database. OK. So 
Uh, part of this talk or workshop was to not only examine how to use uh, Google's serverless technologies to deploy an Angular universal app so you can have server-side rendering, but to also talk about some of the production concerns you might have once you are in the boat of having a server-side rendered app. Um, so let's, let's go back to the app and let's try something. So we've got the article page. We already demonstrated that that server-side rendering is working there. We've got the home page. We already demonstrated server-side rendering is working there. Let's try the author page. So here's the author. Maybe we should try this one. There's James. He has written some blog posts. So I'm going to refresh, and I'm going to go to the network tab, and let's see if this did any server-side rendering. OK, so there's the app root, and there's the router outlet, but there's nothing else. OK, so what can we do to figure out why this particular page did not server-side render? It still worked, which is cool. Like, I, I guess that's impressive. It didn't server-side render, but somehow the page still worked. Uh, what happens, basically, is if the server-side rendering fails, uh, it just gives up. I'm not sure how long it waits before it gives up. Uh, it maybe it just gives up as soon as the error, whatever error happens, and you know it's been it's being kicked out of its process. And uh, regardless, eventually the client side JavaScript arrived in the browser and just took over anyway, and said, "Okay, I know what's supposed to happen. It looks like it hasn't happened yet, so let's go render this page." Um, but we still need to figure out why the server side rendering didn't work for this particular page. And we have a couple ways to do that. So one feature of Google Cloud Run is that it integrates automatically with Stackdriver logging and Stackdriver error reporting. Uh, Stackdriver is Google Cloud Platform's uh, suite of uh, performance and health monitoring tools for applications and uh, systems in Google Cloud. So Stackdriver logging, so we can just search for logging. So this is just the general logging view, and you can sort of pick what, what logs you want to look at. So I'm going to go to Cloud Run. We're going to look at our universal app. So you can see a bunch of request logs, stuff happening here. Ah, OK, this looks a little interesting. It looks like a big stack trace. Stack traces are usually bad news. You do not want to see stack traces. OK, error, something broke on the server. That's not contrived. Uh, so stack trace happened on the, oh, that's the page we were looking at, authors and some non-memorizable ID. OK, that's the page. It didn't work. So this must be the problem. So we've got a stack trace. Looks like it happened in main.js. Uh, I'm not sure the stack trace is really going to help me figure out where the problem was. Uh, you know, the code maybe got bundled to some degree and has been moved around. and main.js 526, I mean, is, do we even have a main.js? I guess there is, but it's only 13 lines long. So that stack trace really is not going to help me there. OK, what can we do? Um, well, we could check out stack driver error reporting, see if that uh, can shed any more light on this. <clears throat> what error reporting does is automatically for App Engine and Cloud Run and Cloud Functions, if if your code writes anything to standard error, um, Stackdriver error reporting picks up, that on, picks up on that automatically and actually creates new error instances in this dashboard um, that can give you details such as how often it's occurring, when it last occurred, the actual stack trace, and then some other capabilities. Like uh, you could subscribe to get notifications. So you, like for example, right here, it's got this little uh, info bar. I can turn on notifications for Stackdriver error reporting. And what that does is it will send an email to you whenever a new type of error occurs in your application. So if I had turned that on before I deployed to production, then the very first time I tried that uh, broken page, I would have got an email saying, yo, you got a problem with your app. Uh, so when it comes to dealing with production, that's something that's very handy. Um, it's still pretty basic. If you wanted to do something really advanced, you could dig into Stackdriver monitoring, and you can set up custom uptime uh, checks, custom alerting policies. You could alert yourself on any kind of policy you want. Um, Cloud Run sends metrics by default to Stackdriver monitoring, such as how many instance, 
uh, seconds are being used, uh, how much memory is being used. Like, if your instance exceeds some memory, memory limit, you can have it send you an email for that. So looking at this error, something broke on the server. OK, it actually does have something a little interesting, author component. OK, that gives me some direction. Home author.module.ts, bunch of HTML, bunch of JavaScript. This might be the problem. <laughs> but in case it wasn't this obvious, there is one more thing you can try to figure out what's wrong. And that is to use the cloud debugger. So how do you normally debug an app that's running in production? Do you add console.log statements and redeploy? Yeah? I'm seeing nodding heads. <laughs> um, sometimes that's a pain. Usually it's a pain. Um, how long does it take you to get the deployment out? Like, that's something to think about. Like, how long is it going to be before you're able to actually start debugging, right? Um, what about replicating the particular use case? Maybe it's only happening on a given user, and you don't have a way to like act as them to sort of replicate their use case. Like, it's literally something that it always works on your machine, but it doesn't work when you go to production, and this particular user does a particular thing. Um, well, I think most people are probably familiar with uh, Chrome DevTools or anything else that can uh, debug JavaScript running in the browser. You can put that little debugger statement in, and it'll pause execution. And you can sit there and step through stuff. That's actually not very helpful, though, in production when it's like some user of yours. Like, you can't call them up and be like, can you edit the source code and like step through stuff in Chrome DevTools? Like, you can't like do that. Um, and you don't want to put it. You don't want to deploy a debugger statement to production. Like that's bad, because um, it will actually pause everyone else. So with Cloud Debugger, you can just sort of you can pull it up here. If you go to cloud.google.com debugger docs, it'll have some explanations on what uh, Stackdriver Debugger is. What it is is it allows you to debug your productions as they run. Sorry, debug your applications as they run in production. Um, so on the fly, it can add uh, what we call snapshots to your source code, as well as log points. It can dynamically insert logs to your code. So the very next time someone hits a particular code path, it'll trigger those logs, and they'll show up in Stackdriver logging. With the snapshots, that one's kind of like a breakpoint, except it doesn't stop execution. So if you can figure out the code path that a particular user is hitting in production that you can't seem to replicate, you can go to debugger, you can add a snapshot to that point in time, and then the next time the user goes through that path, it'll actually capture all the state of the code at that point in time, and it'll just display it in the dashboard. So you can actually examine, uh, whoops, you can examine like the state of various uh, variables when the user went through a particular code path. So how would we do this? Hmm. There's a bunch of instructions. I think our workshop doc might have something in here. <clears throat> OK, so what we want to do is we want to install the trace agent, the debug agent, and the profile agent. I haven't talked about trace and profile here yet. But what trace does is trace will uh, trace all of your RPCs. So you use that for performance analysis on I.O. and things like that. Profiler is basically. Uh, the Chrome DevTools profiler running in the cloud on your production app and, and uh, saving profile snapshots on the fly uh, to be used in the, the Cloud Console dashboard. So before we do this, because obviously we're going to change code and we're going to need to redeploy. And it took a little while to redeploy. So we're going to add what's called a Cloud Build YAML file. And what this does is we're going to configure Cloud Build to not only build the image for us, but deploy it for us at the same time. And we have a slightly different method of building the Docker image this time. We're using what's called the Canico cache. I don't know. It's like Canico? Canico? I don't know. Uh, Cloud Build has a caching feature where for each additional layer that is added to your image, it can cache those individually. And it can figure out if they have changed or not. Um, so if a given layer hasn't changed, it can just reuse it right away and shorten your build times. So it looks like to do this, we need to add a Cloud Build YAML file. We can do that by simply, let's go to Cloud Shell. We can check out Workshop 2. <laughs> and we've added a Cloud Build YAML file. And we can examine it. 
There it is. It's the same one as described in the wiki. Um, but we're not going to deploy just yet uh, because we still need to go add that other stuff. So we can do that by checking out workshop three. So we're sort of skipping a step. We're just combining two steps into one. Oh, I have a change. Uh, let's get rid of that. And now let's check out step three. OK, so on step three, what's the difference between step two and step three? Um, step three simply added, step three did this. It installed the uh, three libraries, and it added them to server.ts at the very, very top. And it's important that they be at the very, very top. We can check that out. Oops. There they are at the very top. They add hooks to the node runtime to be able to examine everything that's going on and be able to do what they're supposed to do, essentially. OK, so we now have two options at this point. Once again, I can run a command that would trigger the build. I could do that. Do I really want to have to do that every time, though? Um, not really. So what we can do is we can set up automatic builds. So if we go back to run docs, we've got some deploy, continuous deployment from git. Set up continuous deployment. Automating builds using build triggers. OK, that's cool. OK, so with a build trigger, it looks like in order to do a build trigger, you need source code in the cloud source repository. Guess what? That was something we did earlier that I said would be relevant later. So we can go up and set up, go ahead and set up a build trigger. So we're not doing debug yet. We've got to go back to cloud build, cloud build, and go to triggers. And we're going to create a trigger. Let's select a cloud source repository. And let's select the one called OnSnapshot, which is the one we made that we pushed all the OnSnapshot code to. Um, we're just going to call it our ng-conf demo. That's the name of the trigger. It doesn't really matter what the name is. Uh, we're only going to watch the master branch. You can set it up to deploy from every single branch, but our cloud build YAML is actually going to try and deploy a container. And so you don't necessarily want every push to every branch overriding your same container deploy. Uh, so we're just going to limit ourselves to the master branch. And we're not using a Docker file. We're going to use the cloud build YAML file that we just added. And then I'm going to create this trigger. So what this does, will do is every time we push to the master branch, it will deploy our Angular Universal app for us on the fly. So how do we actually push to the master branch the stuff that we currently have on, what are we on? We're on workshop three. We can actually just do this, git push dash f origin, which is the Google Cloud source repository. And then we're going to take workshop three, and we are going to overwrite the master branch for clarity and shortness. Uh, you probably don't want to use force push outside of demos like this. OK, so we just force pushed onto the master branch. Uh, let's go see what's happening. Oh, we're on the page already. History. There is a build running. Sweet. Yay. Uh, that de part of the demo worked. Uh, so we can actually go click on this and see what's happening. It's now using the Conoco cache. Uh, it's the very first time it's running, so there's nothing cached yet. Uh, but the next time we deploy, it will be faster. So this will probably take like four minutes. <laughs> um, but while we're waiting, we can talk about the next uh, other thing we were going to do. OK, so back to our app. We basically figured out where the problem was and why this page was not uh, server-side rendering. There is an error happening on the server, and it only happens on the server. It's pretty convenient if you can find an error that happens on both the client and the server. But if you find an error that's only happening on the server, it makes it a little easier. Uh, if you can uh, have uh, Stackdriver debugger and Stackdriver error reporting available to you. Uh, the automatic build trigger is still running. Looks like it's uh, now running npm install, which is going to be pulling in our new uh, libraries. <clears throat> I think we're getting low on time. So instead of waiting for this build, I'm going to flip over to another project that I already prepared that sort of already has this stuff done. And we can examine what it looks like. So I'm going to switch over to that now. 
Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and close my cloud shell and switch over to the other project. I wanted to show you what um, the trace in the error reporting stuff looked like. So let's look at trace first. Trace. Here we go. So this is a version of the Angular Universal app that I already deployed with trace enabled. What happens is every time the app runs, Trace will record every single RPC that happens and record those here in the Cloud Console. And what happens is if you get at least 100 traces on a given RPC, you can start to do analysis reports on them. And it can tell you like what's the average latency of a given RPC and things like that. I didn't take the time to hit the endpoint 100 times so I could make an analysis report. Uh, but we can just go look at the trace list. And I did it over an hour ago, so we'll switch to four hours. OK. Articles, DX, something, something. All right, we can filter by that, actually. So look, it looks like I hit this page eight times in the last four hours. And the, the time was on the order of 100-something milliseconds. There was one that was 600 milliseconds. Um, Depending on the type of RPC that your page is doing, let's say you needed to make some database reads to MySQL, or you needed to make some HTTP requests to some other service, those would all be broken down in the dashboard in sort of this uh, timeline of all the RPCs. And you could use that to figure out which RPCs of yours are and it involve the most latency. So that's Stackdriver Trace. Um, let's go look over at Profiler. Sweet. I think I have about one minute left. OK, so Profiler takes a heap and memory snapshot of your app as it runs. And I'm not going to dig into it. Um, I, had, I had tried to deploy some contrived code that was really slow that used a lot of memory. Uh, we didn't get a chance to finish deploying it in the other project. But you would be able to dig into this uh, sort of heap and uh, time snapshot to figure out what's going on there. And then debug, I don't think I prepared this one. I didn't. OK, so debugger, I have a different project I can probably show, but I think I'm out of time. So the way de debugger works is it would, it would recognize in this dropdown right here, it would, it would see all the apps that you have deployed. And it would be able to, you'd be able to select one, and then it would show you the source code, and you can add a snapshot, and you could basically examine what happened when a user hit a given code path. Um, if you have any questions about Angular Universal or Angular Fire or this workshop, the booth for Firebase and Google is right outside here. It's at the corner on the other <coughs> side of the wall from registration. And we will be there to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you. <laughs>